Hi everyone, thank you for coming down. Um, this is amazing to be able to do something in amongst a crazy time. Um, so yeah, this, this beautiful building that we're in is called Carlisle Memorial Church. Um, I stepped inside this building three years ago and ever since we've been trying to do something here. So this is a big milestone for us, definitely. Um, and it's amazing to be working with um, such a talented artist as Max. Max um, was going to be opening the festival this year and obviously because of COVID we haven't been able to go ahead this year so again it's an amazing thing for us to be able to produce and put on a show like this tonight. Um, yes yeah, so this building was built in 1875 so it's pretty old um, and it was restored only five years ago so um, this is again one of the very few events that have happened in here and, and we hope there'll be many more to come. Um, and yeah, so tonight Max is going to take us through a workshop and then a live full visual performance. So very excited and thanks very much for getting involved and to our partners. Um, the Arts Council has been supporting AVA, Red Bull and, and PRS as well. And um, all the crew that have been involved, um, Visual Spectrum, Hype Guys and Third Source. So yeah, it's amazing. Thank you. Enjoy tonight. Um, I poured a few whiskies over there, if anyone wants any. Keep warm. No Coke, just, just whiskey. Um, help yourselves. But I think I don't really have a whole like specific class. It's called a master class, but I'm just going to talk, play stuff and talk about it. So, um, What I'll probably do is stick to the most recent album. Um, you can see there's... Uh, there's another projector in the corner which isn't on, but we've got two projectors. Um, and hopefully, you'll probably see this, this one will be the more clear image. So I'll just get started. Also, if you have any questions, you can, there's so few of us, we can pretty much just shout out. And I haven't really got some really specific thing planned other than just playing through the album and talking about all the bits. So if you've got a question midway, just shout out and let's have a chat, you know. The good thing, let's make use of the fact there's, you know, so few of us. So yeah, this was a this project was a commission from the Barbican in London. They, they do like a lot of sort of music and art stuff, um, and they had this yearly theme. I think it was I, can't, I think it was last year. I think it was last year um, about sort of technology and how technology is changing society and crypto and biotech and you know all GM stuff and all the all the rest of it. Um, and they wanted some sort of art, you know, sort of artistic commentary on it. Um, and there was such a wide, wide range of stuff. They had all these, you know, they were just looking at advancement of technology across a huge range of topics. So rather than choosing one topic, I decided to try and I was trying to think about how I could visualize them, you know, the whole the whole thing, the whole lot of it. So I was thinking, what's it all about? And I was like, okay, it's all about people constantly trying to advance their knowledge and their you know, their you know, economics and grow and they always want more and it's just this sort of human drive for more and more and more. So I was like, how can I visualize that? And I thought, okay, that's the infinite, you know, it's this endless drive. So I thought I set about trying to visualize the infinite in lots of different ways and then link it into humans' lives. And that was how the whole sort of show came together. So the first chapter, at least from the, this is how I structured the show, at least the the launch show. Um, the first, it's going to sound pretty bad because actually I'm trying to chat at the same time. But um, let's see. Um, let's see if we can see something now. So this vocal is by James Yorkston. He's like a Scottish lyricist and musician. He's really good. Okay, so a little dot forming in the middle. Um, so this first chapter was about the infinitude of time before and after our short, teeny, tiny little existence. So we were trying to think about a way of visualizing a life in a minute. So it's called a fleeting life, and it's like this idea that we exist for this tiny instant, and then there's this sort of infinitude either side of us. Um, so we set about trying to get imagery of a life and stick it into one minute. Pro like, so you'll see, it's about to start in a second. You'll see this sort of... This is by Kevin McLaughlin, who lives, I think he lives in Sligo. Um, him and his brother, uh, Porrick, are like really amazing visual artists. 
um, and I've done a whole load of projects with him. So you'll get, you'll see Kevin's, a lot of Kevin's family are in this actually. Oh, why isn't it showing on this one? Oh yeah, probably I need to activate something to get it to show at the front. Um, let's see if I put this one on. Oh no, that's not the right one. Anyway, we'll have to just look at the back one then. So which isn't as clear. But yeah, you'll see Kevin's family is, you know, his brothers in there and his dad and like there is cousins and stuff and just a lot of local sort of photography and he and he just brought together sort of moving from life to death, you know. Where it starts with the baby and then eventually it's a nice cheerful way to start. There we go. Actually, it got, well, I tried to put that online on Instagram and it got taken down because of the eye. Apparently, you're not allowed to put you know, like a wrinkly eye or something. It's like, cause it, I don't know, it offends people or something. Or maybe they think trying to, I'm trying to sell some beauty product. Um, so that was the first one. And then we went into... So the way I work, basically, is everything, everything I do, it might look like just a weird abstract video, but it all there's a, there's a reason behind it. So I start with this sort of general idea, how, like a story, how, how I want to theme the, an album, and then I'll think about all these chapters and write the chapters up and then send those to lots of different visual artists. So it ends up, I love the sort of abstract stuff, but it's actually, there's a reason behind everything. Um, so this one, the reason behind this one was um, this idea. So I was doing a lot of research about the infinite and how I can visualize it. And one of the earliest references I could find was this Jewish Kabbalah, this like ancient Jewish mysticism. And they have this like, this really early uh, written reference to the infinite in relation to this sort of deity, basically. Of this infinite white light. It's supposed to be this infinitely bright light that, you know, represents God, basically. Um, so I chat to this uh, French guy called Thomas Vans, who does a lot of, it's all real, uh, real liquids. Like, he, he has all these secret concoctions of things that he mixes together. And then it sort of makes these really beautiful Almost like computer, looks like sort of computer simulated stuff, but it has that extra, I don't know, it's real, so it has that extra fidelity. Um, and as it, as it emerges, you can start to see, we use these ancient, these old cave paintings. This is supposed to be like the birth of, um, you can see the hands like starting to come around the, come from the edges. These ancient cave paintings, it was supposed to be like the, the birth of, um, modern thought and you know this the birth of this whole process which has led us to where we are now sort of wanting to constantly advance and grow and all you know for better and for worse um and thomas fans yeah he did, i've done a few projects with him he does really beautiful uh secret mixtures um i won't stay too long on that one because we'll be here all night um so and the, the way i work in terms of the system here is um, I basically run Ableton on one computer and uh, Resolume on the other. Resolume's for you know visuals and Ableton's for audio, audio and I just have lots of clips in Ableton and every clip when I trigger audio clip it triggers a video clip as well and then I've got a whole bunch of like um, synced um, like I can do like live drum triggers, and whenever I, if it, w it doesn't really sound good over ambient music, obviously, but um, there's lots of links between what I would do with the music and what will happen with the visuals. And I spent ages basically just looking at how I like to do a you know, music show, and then thinking for every adjustment I might want to do with the music. If I bring in some sort of glitchy stuff, then I can sync every different musical adjustment to a different visual adjustment. So I was just finding there's hundreds of mappings basically between an Ableton set and a Resolume set, which I set up so that I can um, work like this. Oh yeah, so I won't turn that one on because that's going to go right in your eyes. But there's actually, it goes onto the wall behind you. So actually whenever I do the show, it'll be far better watching from that side. That's basically, it's designed to see from that side. So this screen here is like a semi-transparent screen so that um, whenever, if I switch this one off at the back, 
and you're on, if you're on that side, you wouldn't see anything apart. It would just look like a normal screen. You wouldn't see anything behind, really. And if I did the other way around, if I switched the one on at the back of the room and turned off the screen, then that screen would become invisible. So it's you know from the other side, that screen, that's what it's designed for. So that's whenever I do the show, you guys will be on the other side. But I think for the talk, it was going to be on this side, so I'm sort of nearby you, and so that we can you can see that you know what's going on a bit more. Um, so yeah, this one, you know, this is a. Edward Moybridge is like one of the earliest guys to do moving image. He took, you know, this is like ancient moving image from, I don't know what year, this is probably, I guess maybe early 1900s or something. Um, and this was just this endless pursuit, you know, it's this woman and she's sort of crun you know, hunched over and sort of looks like she's had a hard time and she just keeps going. Obviously it's a loop, but it just, and then Kevin, this is with Kevin McLaughlin as well. He sort of, created all this the, the thoughts going on in her head and this yeah the expression around it so this was just this endless pursuit basically it's called the pursuit of ghosts you know just like this endless where the whole concept of this thing was about how people need these sort of endless tasks it's a little bit like if you have a football team you like or whatever some sports team and you want them to win and if they win you want them to win the next year, and if they win the local cup, you want them to win the you know national and then the Euros and whatever. It's like, and even if they win the World Cup, then you want to win the World Cup the year after. There's no, it never ends, you know. And that's the whole. We're all, you know, we need these sorts of endless, particularly now, you know, we need these endless sources of meaning, and that was. So th there's a you know there's a good reason for this sort of this yearning for the infinite idea, but it, obviously the negative sides of it come around in this this video shows some more of the negative sides in terms of um, growth of um, built structures and how our cities are just expanding and expanding and populations are growing and growing. So I, I wanted to comment on the sort of beautiful side, the, the artistic side, but also the more, you know, the negative side in terms of consumption and you know, get those ideas into the project as well. So this one is with Kevin McLaughlin as well, actually. And he's taken loads of imagery of, sorry, I've got one right in your eyes, I wanna, uh, okay, there we go. Um, yeah, he's taken imagery of cities and then repeated it. So you get these seamless um, repetitions of these structures just to make it look like these, that they go on forever. And the idea, and also this infinite parallax. So infinite parallax was another way of representing the infinite where you've got this something going off into the vanishing point but at the vanishing point is basically you know the infinite distance away um, so we got these huge structures so Kevin again I think this is Hong Kong and he's just taken you know he's taken these structures and then seamlessly duplicated them and then for the music so the way I work is always I'll start with some sort of idea like this and then I'll write down the idea and then I'll send it to the visual artist and I'll figure out, okay, I'm going to work with Kevin on this one. And then he starts sending me a few ideas. And then I'm working on the music at the same time, trying to think, well, here's what the concept is, repetition and, these, and this infinite parallax, but what should the music be? So I always try and make the music map to the, to the visuals in some sense. And sometimes it's just like, you know, what does it look like? What does it feel like? Just these sort of more like I'm doing a film score. With this one, there was a, you know, repetition was a really easy one to, you know, I already do sort of techno stuff. So it's repetition is a very natural thing to put in there. Um, so I just went for this really repetitive synth stab. That's it, the whole track is just this one synth stab that goes all the way through. And it doesn't change very much. Uh, it started to change a little bit now to develop it, but you know, the start particularly, just this one chord that goes for ages. Uh, and there's not a whole lot else going on. So it was a really easy way to map the idea of the visual to the idea of the music. Um, and then, so you know, me and Kevin sent, the way I work is generally, I'll write some idea, send it to them, they'll send me back some visual ideas, and we're sort of bouncing back and forth and you know, seeing what works. And actually with this, you know, I, d I wrote some other music for this, which didn't really work, so I completely started again because um, based on the visual. So sometimes I'll restart the music based on the visual. Sometimes the, you know, the visual doesn't work, and sometimes it doesn't work at all. You know, sometimes I try and work with people and it just, we just fail, but you know, that's just the way it goes. Um, but yeah, Kevin did a great job on this as well. Um, so let's see if I can go to the next one. Let's see. Oh dear. That's no good. See, so this is what happens when I try and talk while I'm doing something. Um, parting ways. Oh yeah, so this one 
The other thing I did for this was, um, because I designed the show to work in a wraparound, so I, I'm really into this, like, I really love projecting onto surfaces like we're doing at the moment. Um, and I actually built the whole show to, sorry, I'm just gonna see if I can get the rear one on. Okay, there we go. Um, I wonder if I put the side one on, whether it'll work. No, maybe not. Um, so all, basically all the visual controls, and all the visual controls come from Ableton, which is great, it makes my life easier. That's how I can do the, the visuals and the music at the same time, is because it all comes from one place, so I don't actually need to touch Resolume. I just, all the Resolume controls are coming from inside Ableton. So my MIDI controllers that go into Ableton, will do both at the same time. Um, and what I did with this one and a lot of the show was ask the visual artist to create it in like super widescreen. So rather than just one 16.9 image in the middle, they created three 16.9 images and then a 16.9 image on the roof and one on the floor as well. So it, it covers, if, I, if we had six projectors or five projectors, we could cover that wall, the roof, the t left and right and the floor and it would, the image would be continuous. There's actually the animation would move you know, one thing could move from the floor onto that side, onto the air, onto the roof. So it's it's designed. Is it working? I think uh, it almost looks like it is working. It's hard to tell. Um, but I think yeah, if I if I turn that one on, it's going to be right in your eyes, and it's not even coming on for some reason. Um, but yeah, this one was by a French artist called Maxime Corseret, who did this. Who did he also did the order from chaos video for me, which is. A really good, vid really good video. Um, so we wanted to do this idea of in just division, you know, like infinite division, and it starts off with these tiny, you know, like ato you know, atomic scale things dividing, and then it sort of grows and grows. Now we've got cells dividing, and then it basically grows and grows until eventually we've got planets and universes dividing in some sort of multiverse idea. Um, so we're just looking at the an infinity you can get to by having th dividing structures. Um, which lends itself to life, obviously. And I do a lot of, I used to work in, you know, bioscience stuff, so I, I love putting, you know, I do a lot of, like, biologically inspired projects. Um, oh yeah, it is, it is working. So you can see that the image in the middle, actually the wall behind you guys is a, is a continuation of the, yeah, the wall behind you guys is a continuation of the image at the back. And so you can see things moving in and sort of co coalescing into that central point. Um, so yeah, it's really fun. When a lot of the, basically, what happens is I'll turn up, I'll turn it down a bit. And I'll, I turn up to, I generally turn up to gigs with a couple of projectors. Um, there's these little 6K projectors which fit in a flight case. I can take them on a flight, and those are that back wall and the wall behind you is just these little projectors I can carry on a plane. So they're they're pretty punchy. You know, they're good for they're good enough for, um, you know, smaller venues. I mean, not this is particularly small, but and actually, well, they're working pretty well. Um, so yeah, what generally what I'll do is I'll carry a couple of projectors with me and then get the main, a main one or two projectors hired by the venue, the bigger ones, the heavier ones, which is the one on the other side of the goals, and then sort of join them all up and just turn up somewhere and just think, okay, what's the space, and try and use the space as a canvas. I really like, I love the way projections sort of interact with you know the structure of a building. So I'll just rather than putting screens up and trying to you know do it properly like that, I'll just, I just really like the way, it, you know, to get the interaction between the architecture and the, and the imagery. Sorry, I think it's shining right in your face now, isn't it? Let me turn that one off. Um, yeah, let's do the next one. Um, it's going to make another mess. Um, is it even going to play? So, this one was by... Uh, uh, a lady called Jessica In, who she's like mathematician architect. Um, she works at Bartlett in London. It's like an architecture school, and she teaches sort of um, yeah programming and maths to do with architecture. But she's really in, she does a lot of beautiful art based on you know maths. So I find this idea of this tiling system that could tile an infinite plane without repeating. It's called Penrose tiling. Actually, Roger Penrose, he won a Nobel Prize maybe two weeks ago or something. Um, one of his many things, one of his many ideas is this thing called Penrose tiling. And 
it's based on, I think my understanding is that by using irrational numbers, so you know, basically if you have a normal tiling system, you can always take out the whole point of it. You can take a tile, right? And a tile is a repeating unit and you can you know, tile whatever plane you want, but there's, a, there's repeating, there's a smallest unit that just repeats over and over and over. But with Penrose tiling, you can have, there, there's never a repeating unit for, you know, even on an infinite plane. So it's a sort of, it's an aesthetic, it's like a way of visualizing something that relates to the infinite because it's a, it's a pattern which never repeats, you know, however far it goes. And it's based on, it uses irrational numbers to sort of seed the edge, the edge ratios because the rationals have these, you know, non-repeating digits which go forever, so you can sort of seed the structure with that, and it, you get this infinite tiling system. And it, it just, you know, aside from that, all that nonsense, it sort of just looks nice, right? So and that's the whole point with this stuff is there's a lot of ideas that go into it, but in the end, it just it needs to look nice and it needs to sound nice and it needs to work for people who don't care about that stuff because. I think most of the people that come to my gigs don't care, you know, about Penrose tiling or whatever, but they like if something looks beautiful and, you know, is immersive and sounds good, you know, that's that's the true meaning of the work, you know. Um, but I just, I also really enjoy the whole reading process and, you know, sort of researching them, chatting to all the, you know, researchers and physicists and all these people I get to chat to, just because I find that interesting. Um, but I don't, yeah, I think it's important that people don't need to care about that to enjoy the work as well. Um, so yeah, you've got these crazy animated tiles going on. Um, let's see, I'll skip through. Probably going to get behind time. Um, let's skip to this one. So... This is with a guy, another mathematician called Andy Lomas, um, who I've worked with before. He, he does these, Andy Lomas is great. He, um, so he studied maths and then he sort of went into special effects for films. He worked on The Matrix and he worked on um, Charlie, and the, like that, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory one that had the, the, re, the modern one with, that, what's his name, that famous, Johnny Depp. Um, so he worked on these like Hollywood films doing you know, making mathematical models of, you know, I don't know, a vat of acid or whatever, um, and working on the systems, how the visual systems talk to each other and just building, you know, the infrastructure you need to do these, these high-end Hollywood films where they're basically developing new techniques, at, you know, to make the film because they have these big budgets. So he, he worked on this sort of stuff, and then this is also continuous, so it sort of, it'll wrap around, the whole thing wraps around from the middle to the wall behind you. Um, and again, if we had another projector, it could wrap around on that side, and if, and if we had another picture on the roof, it could wrap around onto the roof, and if we had another on the floor, it could wrap around all, you know, make sort of totally immerse us. Um, so the launch show I did for this project was, you know, we had all of those surfaces covered, um, but it's, you know, it's obviously a mission to like get so many projectors and stuff. Um, so yeah, Andy is a mathematician who did did these films and then just decided to make art using maths. So he he. Um, he built these models of cell growth um, and this is a sort of extension of his cellular morphogenesis models so it's like rather than having cells that divide it's got these it's you know, the cells are all joined so it's making this lattice which keeps dividing and dividing and dividing so it's like an infinitude of I don't know it's like almost going for the infinitesimal idea so you're taking space and you're breaking it up into smaller and smaller units and you get this more and more fine structure so it's just like you know it's an infinitude of dividing down, you know, units of space. Um, and the, the really interesting thing with Andy's work is um, a lot of it comes out looking really biological, even though he doesn't, there's no biology in there. He just makes these models of how things divide and, you know, maybe he'll simulate how they interact with light or nutrients. So they ha there's things related to biology in there, but there's no actual, you know, he doesn't put any biological data in there or anything. It's just, and he gets these emergent, he never knows what's going to happen. He'll set up a model and then he'll run it with a particular set of parameters. And sometimes it'll just do nothing. It'll just be all, you know, the same all over, or it'll just be total chaos. You can't see any structure at all. And then there's these really, he's sort of searching the parameter space of his models to find these interesting areas of behavior. Um, and it basically it relates to how the likelihood of complexity emerging from you know from a system from a, any system. 
So it basically got a lot to do with. Um, one, second, one second, why is it not showing anything? Um, maybe I need to press that one. Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, it relates a lot to the emergence of life and this question of. Um, was it the Fermi paradox? So you've got this idea of why aren't why aren't there aliens here? And you know some people say, oh, it's they're really far away; they can't get to us. Or some people say oh, it's really improbable that they'll that they actually that there is no aliens. There's only us, and you know there's, it's so improbable that life happens that there's just nothing else. Um, and Andy's work is interesting in that sense because he has these really abstract models in which lifelike complexity emerges, you know, from the from the systems. And the, the the thing he finds is that there's loads of ways of doing it. Obviously, there's the way of you know you can sort of map it to the way life works in our you know in in our world. But you know with his system, you can have these totally totally different ways of doing it. And what he finds is you can get life-like complexity emerging in lots of different ways. So at least you know it's a more of a sort of uh, it's not exactly a watertight argument. But um, his feeling on it is that life is likely to emerge, you know, in lots of different ways, in lots of different places. So the aliens, they're all over the place, apparently, according to him. Um, but yeah, they probably can't get to us because we're too far away. Um, yeah, so anyway, Andy, I recommend have a look at Andy's website. He's got all sorts of interesting madness on there. Um, let's do some Porrick McLaughlin. So... Is that still showing that other one? So yeah, Porrick McLaughlin, Kevin's brother, had this idea of, um, so the circle was a really obvious thing to include. You know, infinity, the circle, going around the circle forever. Um, it's just, it, it features heavily in the in the show. And, and, and Porrick had this idea of doing this um, Using stills, loads of still imagery as of circles he's painted. You know, he went in. I think he lives in Sligo, uh, and he went into you know some industrial wasteland and basically painted these massive circles. You can see him. I think it probably you'll see it more easy there. You can see them. These circles are huge. You know, they're like 50 meters across or whatever. There he is standing in the middle of one of them. He went out there with Kevin and his dad, painted these things, and then they used a drone and took all these stills of these images. And then he, but he did tiny ones, he did massive ones and tiny ones, and and then he sequences them all together to get these like these animations built from these circles, and it's all real. These are all real photographs, you know. It's not so you can see going into his up to the size of a, the edge of a paintbrush, you know, tiny, tiny, and then up to these huge ones that, f that he sort of immerse him, and so he he that, you know they they painted every one of these for real. And then built this animation out of it. It's sort of mind blowing, like what they do, you know, it's brilliant. Um, and then there's the mad, and there's a sort of madness about it as well. The whole, because there was another angle on this, which was uh, there's a lot of people, mathematicians who've worked on the idea of the infinite, have gone mad. And one of the, you know, Cantor, Georg Cantor was the guy who put the infinite on proper mathematical grounds, and there's a sort of a chapter about him in a bit. But he, you know, he ended up in a lunatic asylum, and, you know, there's a, there's a correlation between people that work on these ideas in mass at least, and going insane. And I wanted to you know bring that sort of that sort of madness angle in. And, and Porrick did it really nicely with this. You know, this, 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 there's someone out there painting these massive white circles and just wandering around them. And just you know, just any onlookers would have just been like, this guy's another. Um, but he wasn't because this is what it created. You know, it's amazing. Um, but yeah, we'll see some Cantor stuff in a minute. Uh, so this one next, well, this was some machine learning stuff. So I wanted to also, that's how we're doing on time, which is not loads of time left. Um, I also wanted to do some machine learning approaches to the problem as well. And I found this guy, Mimo Actin. Mimo does, he's, I think he's from Istanbul, but he, he sort of travels a lot and does a lot of installations and... Um, he has these systems which um, he just feeds them a ton of you know these um, adversarial neural network things that they basically compete to see which network can be the best to replicate uh, whatever image and he feeds it with all these different images from different scales you know like universe scale tiny ones big ones small ones and 
and then it and then it sort of creates this networked um, map of the the structure of these images, and then it traverses between them according to you know similarities in the images rather than similarities in scale or how we would organize them. It, it sort of categorizes them itself, and then recreates frames that allow it to take this path from all these different things of hugely different scales. So it was the, this idea of playing with the infinitude of space and just, you know, like, things can go on forever and ever, but even when you get to these huge scales, things, actually, there's similarities in structure, you know, like the, the, the structure of, you know, cosmic entities can be similar to the structure of, you know, microbiological entities and that sort of thing, and hit these simulations or these, these neural networks do that, they find those correlations and then morph between them. So you get this really interesting sort of, I don't know, journey through these sometimes recognizable, sometimes totally abstract forms. Um, and it also plays, there's like loads of different panels. You can see behind you, sorry, there's like a load of panels. So it basically shows you several walks through, you know, it's giving you a lot of different iterations of the simulation running through these different images. Um, yeah, but Mimo, again, I'd recommend checking out Mimo's work. He does a lot of amazing sort of AI art stuff. Uh, I'm going to skip some of it because there's not that much time. Uh, I'm just going to do a perpetual motion. So this was a guy called Nick Cobby who I've worked with loads. He lives in Mexico City. He used to live in Nottingham. I went to, I was at uni in Nottingham. I think I met him there, like early 2000s, and we've done a whole ton of projects together over the years. Um, he moved to Mexico City, and then I thought, that was just when I started this project, and I thought, okay, Mexico City is you know, one of the biggest cities in the world, and I wanted to bring in this, um, I wanted to bring in people, you know, endlessly in, you know, in their activity doing stuff that people do. Um, this idea, it's a bit like people being the rats in the, in the wheel that are spinning, and they're just endlessly getting up and doing their things, and you know, it's that we're all locked into the system, infinitely acting, and acting out the the sort of systems that we're embedded in. So he, he sort of captured that um, in Mexico City with these a lot of drone footage uh, really beautifully. And there's like, so I, I mean, the good thing is Mexico City, the laws are a bit more relaxed as well. So he's able to just get a drone and just go out in all these public places and just get all this stuff without getting arrested or whatever. Um, so, uh, I won't play it for too long because we're sort of behind time. Um, but there's a really nice shot with a bull ring with like, you know, I think there's like hundred, you get to see a hundred thousand people, you know, the, at a bullfighting show, um, which is pretty mad to see, but I, it'll take a while to come in, so I'll not do that. I'm just going to skip on to Aleph 2. So this was Cantor, this mathematician who went mad. I think it was probably, I think it's maybe, uh, I'm probably going to get this wrong. I reckon it was 1800s, maybe mid 1800s or something. Um, and we actually, we literally went down the, like, I, went, I found a mathematician called Martin Krzywinski in Canada. He's like a, um, he does a lot of data visualization for a bio, um, um, yeah, basically a biological sciences department um, at a university. And we basically went through Cantor's work, you know, this idea of counting and the system it sets, basically it's set theory. So the Cantor developed this idea that you can, <laughs> a way of, quantifying the infinite would be to um, count and say you've got a set which is basically you've got a list of numbers and this list of numbers has you know you're just counting from one to infinity and that's one list you can have another list which counts from in a different way and if you can pair up every member of each list with the other list, then are, they're the same size. It's like one pairs with, in this case, you can see one pairs. So you can have, you can have all, the, all the odd numbers. So one pairs with three, or one pairs with three, and then five and seven and nine or whatever. All the odd numbers can pair off with all the integers one to infinity. So they're the same size, even though one's only got all the odd numbers. One has all the numbers, but you can pair every member so they're the same size. And what Cantor found was you can have particular lists which you can't pair, and then you get these bigger sizes of infinity. That's the sort of, in a nutshell, the idea. And we visualized the process. And annoyingly, it came out some sort of like matrix looking thing, which was annoying, but um, yeah, that's the way it was. Um, and it gets Aleph 2, the name of the track, is this uh, second, so Aleph Null is like the smallest infinity, like the, the integers one, you know, count from one, normal numbers. 
Um, and then Aleph 1 is the next biggest infinity, and then Aleph 2 is the even bigger one. And we managed to show visually the process of getting um, from, you know, counting from the, the normal numbers up to the bigger ones through these techniques that Cantor developed. The diagonal, he, there's two diagonal arguments, and I'm not going to bother going into them, but if you're, if you're interested, if you look at the music video, it explains how it all works. And there's also um, the top left of the screen and the top right of the screen, there's a little key that says what's happening. So this is, you can see, basically, this is a way of proving that one set of things can be counted. So it basically counts all the fractions here by drawing a diagonal through them and counting every one on a diagonal. So this, and then there's another diagonal argument to show that there's uncountables. So I'm not going to go into that in too much detail because you're probably not that interested. Um, and we're nearly there. And then you can ask some questions. Um, so transcendental tree map. This was another interesting one, actually. Um, I sort of went between, you know, I wanted to show like some really human stuff, you know, people in cities and you're know, working and the life of a person and you know, I was sort of interspersing the show between these really human ideas and then these really sort of mathsy sort of philosophical ideas to try and approach the, the same topic from different angles and try and make it not too dry, but not, and, and also, but also technical, you know, with enough meaty stuff in there for people who did want to delve in. Um, so this one, um, transcendental tree map is the digits of pi. So what we did was, this is with Martin as well, Martin Krasinski. We mapped the digits of pi to a tree. I mean, the digits of pi, pi obviously, I'm sure you've heard of, it's like a, a number that's important in the, you know, the ratio of the circumference to the diameter of the circle. So it's just a, a natural constant. Well, yeah, mathematical constant, I should say. Um, and it comes up all over the place in you know, engineering and whatever. It's like really important in nature. But it has an interesting structure because the numbers, um, like all irrational numbers, they, they don't repeat. So it's sort of built of randomness. But I thought it was really interesting because it has this supposed infinite randomness about it. It's like these numbers go on supposedly. We, you know, we, haven't, we don't know for sure, but they seem to go on forever. People, you know, most people would say they do. Um, and there's no pattern in there. It's just, you know, we can map it to this structure and you can see it's, you know, you can see a structure there, but that's only because we've imposed it. That's the, you know, the tree structure. structure. So basically what happens is you continuously subdivide each, you know, you start off with the first digit, the first number of pi is three. <clears throat> so it's divided into three. You get three lines down the middle, the screen's divided into three. And then you've got one. So the, the first block is divided with a, one line through the middle, and then you've got four, so the next block is divided into four, and so on, and you know, onwards and onwards, you can continually subdivide all these things. And what happens is you get this really complex random pattern, but that randomness is also representative of a circle. So it's sort of, in some sense, perf this perfect circle and this total randomness are, in some sense, the same thing. And I think that's really interesting. That's why I've, I've, tapped, I've sort of stumbled across this idea of order and disorder loads of times on different projects. Like there was the, uh, the emergence project, the um, distribution of the primes, and then in the 100 billion sparks project, there was rule 110 to do with, you know, computation and the aesthetics of, um, you know, the aesthetics of computation in the mind, you know, what, what sort of, if you're visualizing what a computing device looks like, you know, what a computing device is, then you get this really interesting interplay between order and disorder. Um, and the same for Andy Lomas's thing, you know, the, the cells, and you've got this things that we see as biological. They have this very telltale sign of being partly ordered, but they're never precisely ordered. That's this order and disorder combined. And the same again in this, you know, digits of pi. You've got a very extreme example where you've got absolute disorder and absolute order, both represented by the same thing, which is, I think, really interesting and to be honest that's that's the whole point of all this stuff aside from making music and doing visuals is like i find it really interesting learning about the sort of like philosophy of science stuff really i find it really interesting learning about that stuff and trying to find the aesthetics of you know you know going to scientific ideas or philosophical ideas and saying what what are the aesthetics of these things and then it turns out most of the time that the aesthetics are really beautiful so it just gives me great fodder for for visual shows and also means I get to spend a lot of time thinking about strange ideas and chatting to strange people, which is great. Um, so yeah, this was Martin Krasinski who 
he specialized. He does a load of like pie visualizations, amongst other things. He's basically a d data visualization specialist. And then Nick Cobby, you know, did the animation. So he took these structures and turned them into this animated structure. Which, oh yeah, you can see it on the wall behind you as well. It's sort of it's finally growing all around us. Um, but yeah, I thought that was sort of interesting that one. Um, but yeah, I'm going to stop there because I think we're we haven't got loads more time, and I guess there's going to be some questions. So maybe I can just pause. And that's actually going to keep playing, but hopefully that's all right. Is there any questions? Um, yeah, how do I source the artists? So, yeah, so some of them, I'm just going to pause this again. To be honest, Vimeo is amazing. You, like early on, the, like these days, a lot of these people I've worked, that I'm working with on this project, for example, I've done a whole load of projects with. So, you know, they're long-term collaborators, but Quite a lot of them I found um, on Vimeo. So I used to. That's maybe that's bright enough for now. Let me. I'll turn this one on. I basically used to go on to Vimeo staff picks and just like go find videos I like, and then just get in touch with people and just start chatting to them. And most of the time, people you know they haven't got time or whatever. Or I haven't got the money, especially when I you know. It's such a lot of work making video content. Um, you know, you have to, for someone like me working on this sort of stuff that's not massively commercially viable or anything, it very much relies on finding people who are interested in the same ideas as me and want to try a new experiment. And generally what I did was just started chatting to a lot of visual artists that I like about, you know, various ideas and then sort of say, you know, that they're like, oh, I'm working on a project for, you know, some brand or something, I don't have time. But, you know, but they, a lot of them be like, but I'll let you know if there's a gap in, you know, my, my sort of paying project, my big, you know, my major, my sort of main projects. If there's a gap, then maybe we can do something. So I just sort of started out by chatting to people. I could find, you know, Vimeo but, or on YouTube or, in, I mean, these days, Instagram, there's tons of, you know, there's a lot of people on my feed that are great artists and, you know, I'll say hello to them. And again, just be in touch with as many people as possible. And then... Every so often, someone gets in touch with me and says, I've got time or I've got a you know, specific idea. I'll, I'll send them ideas I'm interested in. And then they'll get back in touch and just say, oh, I've just come up with this, I, this technique, like Patrick with the, with the circular thing. I've come up with this technique, which I think is linked to the, your ideas for this project. And then, you know, so it's just that having that open communication. And then and it's a numbers game. You know, it's just chatting to as many people as possible and um, sending, just sending ideas out there and just trying to... Um, yeah, um, and, but then over time, there's particular people that I work, you know, keep working with again and again. So I'm doing much less of that now in terms of finding new people. But I probably should do. Actually, I was thinking that I'm working on a new project at the moment, and I was thinking I'd quite like to go back to that just to find some new people and fresh ways of approaching things. Um, so, but it's great. You know, everyone's everyone's works out there, and particularly if you've got ideas that it's it's just a matter of appealing to someone with the ideas, if they're interested in the same things as you, then, you know, it's sort of your, that, yeah, that's half the job done already. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the album, this one that I've just gone through. So that one took, so the commission, it probably took a um, year and a half, I'd say, something like that. Um, maybe even, yeah, I'd say it was a year and a half. So there was probably six months of research and chatting to people, and then probably a year of writing music and working on visual content, um, or maybe nine months, and then maybe three months of this actual three months solid on the performance system, you know, figuring out how to map everything and how to you know do all the. I mean, I didn't. There's a whole other side to it I haven't showed you because obviously I've been talking, but there's a whole load of controls and things that I can live manipulations that I can do and that sort of, you know, the performance side of it. So developing that was probably another few months. Um, but yeah, I'd say about a year and a half. Um, there's no one single way of doing it, but for this project, I found it best to, I wrote all the ideas up first. So I had all the, you know, just in, in you know, ideas in my mind visually what I wanted and then writing them all up, sending that to the visual artists and there was no music done at that point and actually getting them to start the visuals 
or ag at least agree to it. So I knew, okay, this visual artist is doing it and they have this sort of aesthetic. They like to do this sort of thing so that I would know what sort of music would fit with them. So I didn't, I don't think I, there might have been maybe two tracks that I had at least had in, you know, a rough format before I started the visual stuff. But, the, you know, of the 14 or, or tracks, nearly all of them were done at least having, um, knowing which visual artist and what project they were setting you know, and then designing it specifically for that. And then a lot of them were done having actual video content in front of me where I could just see it and go, okay, this, you know, because the, the more, yeah, whenever the visual's there, it, it's really, you, it, from, yeah, I've generally got a clear idea of what, what's needed musically. Um, so, but it can work the other way around. In the past, I'd worked more the traditional way where I'd, you know, finish a piece of music and send it to someone. And then as time's gone on, I've just got more and more involved in the visual process myself so that I've stopped working like that and I've started more just chatting about the ideas and getting getting the visual ideas and the concept ideas first um, and then working from there. So, but it, can, it certainly can work both ways. Yeah, um, I just I, I th like the first ever. I think the first proper EP I ever did was you know I had a video for it, and I don't. I just when I was totally skint and just you know, I just love the combination. And I for some reason I always felt a bit like it's not finished until the video is there. It's almost like whenever I do a if I do a release that has no visual aspect, I feel like it's only it's not finished. So for me, it just was always an integral part of the whole thing. Um, and I think that stems, yeah, I just love visual art as much as music and, and science -y stuff as well. So there's that, it just is something I have to do personally. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, definitely the visuals. Cause, and that's the thing, like sometimes, particularly early on, there was like a lot of um, misrepresentation. People would always contact me and they said, oh, like, how do you, you know, like the, basically the idea was, I don't know, partly, probably partly my fault for how I explained things, but it was like I had this big tune button, you know, and I'd like built some science thing and like, the, you know, like a, I was like, Rick or Rick, Rick and Morty, Rick and you know, like this science, and it's a big tune button and I press it and then this, the, the banger comes out or whatever. And it's just all science, but that's not the case at all. It's, you know, I write music normally, as everyone else does, but trying to fit to particular aesthetics. And actually, the science angle comes into the visuals way more, you know, way more precisely because music is a very particular structure. And I have done some sort of mapping things. Actually, I forgot to talk about the one in Transcendental Tree Map. There was like a system built to like map the structures to a fractal similar to the visual structure. So I've, do, I've done some experiments with you know, making or working with software developers to make um, ways of making music that maps to concepts really precisely. And actually Penrose tiling was another one I didn't talk about. I should have explained that when I was playing through. So the Penrose tiling one with the infinite tiling system, the music had a similar structure to this infinite visual structure. So I made all the, the loop length sort of prime numbers so that they didn't, you know, you can play them all and they, they never, the loops, it took like two months for the loop to repeat precisely. Similar, you know, which obviously isn't infinite, but it's like essentially, you know, it's not, you're not going to hear a repeat all the way through. So there's sometimes I'm able to map musical structures to the concepts. But a lot of the time, if you try and take, you know, raw data and, you know, from, I don't know, from some science idea and put it into music, it just sounds like noise or it sounds really, you know, there's loads, loads of people that do that stuff, like really experimental sound design stuff. But it does, it's not very musical in the traditional sense a lot of the time and not very accessible and I'm and not for I, I love you know I'm a sucker for a nice chord progression and you know traditional musical structures so but with the visuals you can put the sciencey ideas in more you know explicitly you can just dump them in there a lot of the time like as they are and they, they look beautiful like this one the waves one or you know the, anyway I've gone through a ton of it already but particularly visually is where the science stuff can you know, you can present it as it is, and it sort of people can still connect with that. Whereas musically, I try and get it in there as much as possible, but it's sort of harder to get it in there without it turning into like some horrible, m mad white noise thing. You know, that doesn't sound nice anymore. Um, but yeah, definitely the visuals is where 
where it can work nicely. So it's that's another reason that I'm yeah I guess that's another reason why I'm so into the visuals because I, I get to play with these ideas more you know precisely. Yeah. Any more? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. It's a it's a it's a difficult time for for club promoters, owners, you know, DJs and musicians and, you know, that whole thing sort of is in, in trouble, isn't it? Um, definitely. I, I would assume there's going to be a massive influx of this sort of thing, for sure, um, just because it's what electronic musicians can do that is going to, like, events like this, for example, um, where you can actually play something that has a bit of a club aspect to it, but... Um, can work in this sort of environment. So yeah, I, I, th I think you're right. I'm sure there will be loads more of this stuff happening, which which is a good thing. There'll be, there should be some really interesting, it's, you know, it's going to force, because, you know, club music, you know, it's pretty dull, a lot of it, right? There's a <laughs> kick drum, hi-hat, kick drum, hi-hat, you know, a snare on every second kick drum. That's most techno and house music, you know, it's so it's so simple and, like, it's enough to drive you mad sometimes. But, uh, but I guess that's part of the beauty of it as well, it's that hypnotic sort of thing. Um, but I'm really interested to see how this situation pushes creativity. And as a, yeah, it's a really, it'd be an interesting time to see what happens um, as people have to try new things. So maybe yeah, I'm sure we'll get loads of new genres growing and all sorts. Um, so I just yeah, hopefully I, I, hopefully people find a way. Anyway, that's the the main thing is that we'll all find a way of doing it. Yeah. Any more? No? Thank you very much. <laughs>